this sim speculum you can see it is a it has two uh, blades one on top and one at the bottom and there's a groove in the middle now sim speculum has many purposes so it has basically it is used to diagnose or to visualize the vagina to visualize the cervix okay and it is never used alone remember it is always used along with this instrument this is called an anterior vaginal wall retractor okay we short for for short form we call it an avr so what we do is we we in, we introduce the speculum okay um uh, so, so it can be directly introduced in the vagina some people prefer to introduce it like this and then turn it around so introduce the longitudinal axis and then turn it around so that it causes less uh, discomfort to the patient okay common questions that i was asked i remember during my postgraduate days was in 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 especially in colder climates okay what will you do because it's a, it's a, it's made of stainless steel so it's it, as it is it is an uncomfortable procedure for the woman so always try to warm it up in your in your uh, palms and then introduce it otherwise it will be very cold especially in winters if you're using it so small small things the examiners may ask you out, out of the, for those who um, are interested to know a little bit more so what we do is we introduce it in the vagina we depress the posterior vaginal wall and then we lift the anterior vaginal wall with the anterior vaginal wall tractor because the the vagina is a, is is closed the anterior and posterior uh, walls approximate so we have to open it up to visualize the vaginal walls and to visualize the cervix inside so this is how we introduce and then we lift it up using this instrument okay and uh, well, once we do that we are able to visualize the cervix we are able to visualize most of the rest of the vaginal walls okay so it is used for diagnostic purposes like suppose you want to patient has come with postmenopausal bleeding or patient you have you have a you have to take a pap smear or say you want to examine the thread of a copper t of an intrauterine device so diagnostic purposes and therapeutic purposes and therapeutic purposes what are the main things we do whenever we're doing any procedure for example any dilatation and curettage and an endometrial biopsy inserting a copper t removing a copper t during vaginal hysterectomies so this is where all you use a sim speculum okay now the commonly asked questions are or let me first tell you about the cuscos then we'll discuss the advantages disadvantages of both so this is a cusco speculum this also you can see has two valves okay it's a bivalve speculum this is actually if you introduce it at one time only a single valve is being introduced a single blade this is bivalve so two blades are there and when you introduce it and then i press this it opens up okay so this basically displaces the anterior and the posterior vaginal wall and you can visualize the cervix another advantage is it is self locking you can see the lock here once i open it up and i put the lock it stays in place okay so i've locked it now my hands are free and i can do other procedures okay so this is a cusco speculum now advantage of cusco speculum is the biggest advantage is my hands are free okay so if i want to take a pap smear and i don't have an assistant i can easily use a cusco speculum whereas for a sim speculum i put in the speculum then i lift the anterior wall now both my hands are occupied so i need another assistant to come and take the pap smear or to hold the speculum whereas cusco doesn't require assistance okay another advantage of cusco is if if a patient say a sick patient is there or or a immobile patient or a, a, a patient who can't come to the edge of the bed so this can be used even when the patient is in the middle of the bed you don't have to bring her to the edge of the bed and put her in a dorsal position or a lithotomy to examine okay this can be done right in the comfortably when the patient is in the middle of the bed okay these are the advantages what are the disadvantages of a cuscos the disadvantage is that the space is restricted so you can see once i've opened up the cuscos i have only this much space in this space i can put only maybe one instrument okay it leaves me with very less maneuverability very less space to do procedures like when i'm doing a dnc or an endometrial biopsy one instrument will hold the cervix this is a well salam we'll discuss this and then i don't have space to maneuver much space to maneuver other instruments so its use is limited what are the uses it is used for taking a pap smear it is used for removing an intrauterine device 
It can be used for taking a biopsy on the uh, cervix, a punch biopsy. But other than that, it has very limited uses. You can't do DNCs and you can't use it for vaginal hysterectomies. Okay. Another disadvantage is it limits your view of the vagina because it's occupied the anterior wall. Okay. So now your view is limited. So it is an anterior vaginal wall cyst. Gardner cysts are anterior vaginal wall cysts. If there is a vaginal cyst, you will miss it. Okay. So that is the disadvantage of a cuscos. Okay. So another advantage, so this those become the advantages of the SIMS. The advantages of the SIMS are you can do a lot of procedures. You may require assistance, but it gives a lot of maneuverability and it gives a good view of the remaining vagina. It also has a groove for secretions to drain out. Okay, so these are the advantages and disadvantages of a SIMS and a cusco speculum. These are very important instruments, usually in both undergraduates and postgraduates. What uh, I mean, if you are asked to pick an instrument um, uh, during Viva, please pick one of these. These are one of the easiest instruments to answer. Okay. Okay. So now coming to the next instrument, set of instruments. Okay. So once we have visualized the cervix and now we want to do a procedure, we have to hold the anterior lip of the cervix. Okay. So that we get some stability. Say you want to you want to insert an intra so say you want to um, do a dilatation and curettage, you have to have a grip over the cervix, otherwise you will not be able to introduce any other instrument. So once you have a grip uh, on the instrument, you will be able to um, uh, uh, grip on the cervix, you'll be able to do other procedures. So these two instruments, can you see this? This is a valsalam. Okay, it's a long instrument. Okay, it's it has a slight curve in the middle, and if you look carefully at the uh, ends. Can you see those? Those are the teeth. Okay. Mm. I'll yes. put it across my hand. So you can see these are the teeth. So it's a traumatic instrument. Anything which has teeth at the end like this, okay, is traumatic. Okay. That means it can cause trauma to the uh, uh, tissue you're holding. This is a tenaculum. Tenaculum is straight. Okay. And it has one tooth at the end. Okay. So you can see how sharp that is. Okay. Again, I'll show you like this. This is a tenaculum. Okay, the purpose of both is the same. That is to hold the anterior lip of the cervix. Okay, now when will we want to hold the anterior lip of the cervix? I already said during procedures. Okay, for example, if you want to uh, do a dilatation and curettage, take an endometrial biopsy, do a manual vacuum aspiration for say an incomplete abortion, or if you want to do a vaginal hysterectomy, okay, we hold the anterior lip. A tenaculum is preferred in primary gravid women or women who, so not primary gravid, women who are nulli, nulli parous would never have had children. Their cervixes are a little smaller, okay, and a tenaculum may give a better grip on the cervix, okay, but this is more traumatic. Now, the, the question which is commonly asked with this instrument is tell me instances where you will hold the posterior lip of the cervix. Okay, can anyone answer that on the chat box? I would like this to be an interactive session. What are the indications for holding this, the posterior lip of the cervix, not the anterior lip, the posterior lip? Okay, caldocentis is very good. Kunj. So basically, uh, uh, when we want to approach the pouch of Douglas, that is the posterior fornix. Okay, sure. so the cervix is here. Anteriorly, we have the bladder. Posteriorly, we have the pouch of Douglas. I want to lift the cervix now so that I can ac get access to the pouch of Douglas. And when do we want to get access to the pouch of Douglas? If we're doing a caldocentesis, say a patient has come with suspected ruptured ectopic pregnancy. I want to put a needle in the POD and see if there's blood. So how will I access that POD? I will put in a sim speculum. I will hold the posterior lip. I'll pull the posterior lip up and I will try to look Put my needle inside. Also, when I'm doing a colpotomy, colpotomy is making an incision in the pouch of Douglas. For example, if I'm draining a pelvic abscess or I'm trying to get access to the fallopian tube, it's not done nowadays, but a few decades earlier, vaginal tubectomies were done. We would open the pouch of Douglas, grab the fallopian tube. So anything you want, you want where you want to give an incision on the posterior fornix so you get access to the pouch of Douglas, you will hold the posterior lip of the cervix okay so that is about a tenaculum and the speculum okay now to the next instrument let's go and order this instrument what is this this is a uterine sound okay so uterine sound again you can see it's a long instrument it's a thin instrument 
it has a slight curve at the end. This is because the uterus is not straight. The uterus is antiverted or retroverted. So according to the axis of the uterus, the instrument is introduced. It also, if you look carefully, I'm not sure it's visible here, but it has gradations. Okay, centimeters on one side, inches on the other side. Okay, so a sound, any when you hear the word sound, that is uterine sound or bladder sound, it is basically used to sound that organ or measure that organ. Okay, so that is, uh, one second. So yeah, so that is, why we use the why we use the uterine sound is to measure the length of the uterus. For example, if we're inserting a copper T or an intrauterine device, we will sound the uterus to see the length of the uterine cavity. If we're examining a patient with, say, cervical elongation, a patient with prolapse, and we're examining the patient with cervical elong you're suspecting cervical elongation, you will measure the distance from the internal loss to the external loss with the sound. And then the internal loss till the fundus of the uterus. So this is where you will use a sound. Okay, so any endometrial biopsy or doing or a dilatation and curettage, you want to know the length of the uterus so that inadvertently you don't perforate the uterus because say you measure the length of the uterus is eight centimeters. Okay, and then during the procedure, you find that your instruments are going beyond eight centimeters. So you will now suspect a uterine perforation. So that's why it's important to have an idea of the length of the uterus beforehand only. So this is a uterine sound. Okay, uh, one thing I missed is to when you're holding a pregnant cervix, okay, avoid a valsalam. So if you're doing a dilatation and evacuation or a manual vacuum aspiration, say in a missed abortion or a complete abortion, okay, then you will not use a valsalam, okay, because it's traumatic. So pregnant cervixes are very, very soft. Then you will use this instrument. What is this instrument, anyone? Sponge holding forceps. Yeah, this is a sponge holding. Good, Kunj, you can just, all of you can also unmute and ask your doubts or unmute and answer at any point of time, okay? So this is a sponge holding. And if anyone is asking doubts on YouTube, uh, Kunj, could you just yes. uh, keep checking yes, and ask Yes, I'm checking yeah. them, yes. Okay, thank you. So um, uh, this is a sponge holding forceps or a ring forceps. This is, you can see compared to this, how atraumatic this is. You can see there are just some serrations, but there are no teeth, okay? Yeah. So this is traumatic, yeah. this is atraumatic, this is preferred to when you say you're doing a suction evacuation for a molar pregnancy for a for a the, uh, complete abortion or sorry an incomplete abortion or a retained products of conception the cervix is very soft so prefer holding it with a sponge holding forceps okay now after the sound we have um, these instruments okay so you can see these okay these are a set of instruments they are graduated in size okay i'll just show you a few of them size wise these are basically Hagar's dilators, okay, or mechanical cervical dilators. Okay, now can anyone tell me where we where will you want to dilate the cervix? In case of uh, abortion or yes, during so, the first time, yes. second time. So sure. usually the cervix is closed. So any if you want access to the uterine cavity, you have to dilate the cervix. And how can we dilate the cervix? All the different methods of dilatation. Uh, there are medical methods, there are surgical yes. methods. So yes. medical so methods yeah, tell me. include putting drugs like misoprostol, uh, okay. lamin area tent techniques also yeah. used. Okay, and surgical good. techniques inc include like uterine sounding, the first dilator, followed by yes. Hegas dilators, yes. Yes. sequentially okay. dilating. Very good. So we have pharmacological techniques and we have mechanical techniques and we have combined techniques. Say you have a patient who is having a uh, say if you have a patient who you want to do an MTP for, say she's nine weeks pregnant and she's come in for a medical termination of pregnancy by the surgical method. So you're doing a suction uh, evacuation. Now, before the suction evacuation, you have to first dilate the cervix. So as Poon said, we can pharmacologically dilate the cervix using prostaglandins. And the most common prostaglandin used for dilatation of the cervix for these procedures is PGE1 or mesoprostol. It's available as a tablet. It can be given orally, vaginally, rectally, sub, any submucosal route or oral route. Or so we give uh, we give mesoprostol usually as 200 or 400 or 600 micrograms, and that is used to dilate the cervix. We can also use mechanical dilatation, and that is by different types of dilators. These are the most common dilators. These are called as Hagar's dilators. Okay, we, the other types of dilators available are Matthew Duncan, uh, uh, Hawken Amber dilators. But if you go to most OTs, will have or most labor rooms will have these dilators. Now, they, they are basically numbered according to the 
diameter of the dilator and each side each uh, opposite side has the is increasing in gradation so if this is size one and two then this will be size three and four okay then the gradation is written here okay this is sorry this is size five four and five so four and five then you have this is size six and seven okay so it's increasing and usually this is the largest dilator this is size uh, uh, 11 and 12 okay some dilators are in in increasing um gradation of 0.5 so you will may 5 10.5 11 11.5 12 some are in terms of 1 1 millimeter so it's either 0.5 millimeter or directly 1 millimeter increase in gradation okay so these are uh, yeah so these are uh, uh, so how how do we know how much to dilate to anyone um, like one number less than that trimester in which she so, in, okay so some, yeah case. so there's a little controversy in this some some books say till the period of gestation we dilate till that number some books say one less so if she's eight weeks we dilate till Hagar's number seven but some people say if she's eight weeks dilate till Hagar number eight so there's a little controversy in this where you're reading from okay but as you're saying you're right if she's eight weeks the dilate till Hagar's number seven okay and then we introduce that size of the suction cannula okay and these are the suction cannulas okay so these are plastic cannulas these are also called as carman's cannula okay you can see it has a hole in the end to aspirate all the matter. so, so yes. this, this is like we're doing a nine weeks mtp this is what you'll use so this is the cannula you'll introduce after dilating so if she's nine weeks pregnant you will dilate till hager's number eight or some books it will hager's number nine and introduce the carman's cannula size nine same size as the weeks of gestation. Now, these are color-coded. Okay, I have three of them here. They are color-coded depending on the size, but the size number is also mentioned on the packet. Okay, the packet. This is a, a white color-coded, and you can see the size written here is 10. So you use this. Now, this is then attached to, what is this attached to? It's attached to a suction apparatus, yeah. an electrical suction apparatus, or a manual vacuum apparatus okay the electrical suction apparatus is lying somewhere here in the ot but it's usually the same suction machine which you see in your labor room or in the ot the electrical machine or you can use this what is this this is a manual MBSA. vacuum as instrument okay it is it was uh, developed basically for low resource settings where electricity was a problem where electrical suction apparatuses could not be used because of in rural in rural places around the world because of electricity issues and this has gained a lot of acceptance in recent times okay many many years back so this is manual vacuum aspirator so this has three parts okay it has the part which has the valves which creates the suction the syringe it has a lock here it has the syringe okay and it has the plunger okay so what do we do when we have to do a manual vacuum aspiration we assemble all the parts okay i'll put the lock back here okay so what is initially done is after dilating the cervix, okay, with the pharmacological, with mesoprostol or with the Hagar's, we introduce the Carmen's cannula, okay, and then we create the vacuum in this syringe. How do we create the vacuum? We first press both the locks, okay, see, I've pressed both the locks, okay, one lock and then the second lock. Once I've locked this device, then I pull the plunger back. Okay, like this. Okay, now yes. this is called a loaded syringe. Okay, this loaded syringe, the Carmen's cannula is in the cervix. I attach this, this is, it is in the cervix just beyond the internal loss. Okay, I attach this loaded syringe to the Carmen's cannula and then I release the pressure that is by pressing these two. Now listen carefully, you will hear the release of pressure. Did you hear that swoosh sound? I'll do it again for those who didn't hear. So that release of pressure will cause suctioning of all the products of conception. Hopefully. Did you hear that? Okay, so that is yes. release of pressure and everything gets suctioned inside here. Once it is full, you can just detach it, empty the products and then again 
re recreates the pressure okay and then do it again so you can do it as many times as required okay and okay as many times as required okay and how do we how do we so we we with this cannula while doing the suction evacuation we either do rotatory movements okay while this is attached we either do rotatory movements or to and fro movements but not too much beyond the internal loss so this is the internal loss this is the distance i need to go inside otherwise it can lead to perforation of the uterus okay so this is how and how a manual vacuum aspiration is done you can also instead of this use the electrical suction apparatus which is usually available in most modern ot's but in a low resource setting this is the instrument of choice it doesn't require electricity it is very easy to use okay and by chance if you perforated the uterus the negative suction will get closed off so nothing else will get suctioned in because there's no it is no longer a closed uterine cavity if it has been perforated whereas an electrical suction will keep suctioning out so the chances of injury are higher with an electrical suction chances of injury are less with a manual vacuum aspirator okay so any doubts in this before we move for forward okay so now no continuing doubts. the same scenario okay thank you so nine weeks pregnant we've died what did we do we put a sim speculum we held the cervix with the valsalum we, uh, uh, we we don't sound a pregnant uterus usually we dilated with with hegras dilator we did the suctioning with a manual vacuum aspirator now what will i do i have to check if the procedure is complete if everything has yeah. come out so what do i do uh, which instrument will i use now we use a um, uterine curette to use just... this instrument what is this instrument a uterine curette yes this is a uterine curette now if you see a uterine curette don't get it confused with this instrument okay this is a anterior vaginal wall retractor dekho this see how different it is this is so big okay and this is so small okay this is an anterior vaginal wall retractor it has huge huge ends okay whereas a uterine curette has very small ends okay and it has two ends okay one end is the sharp end this is the sharp end okay can you if you look carefully you can see that it is much much sharper compared to this end okay this is the blunt end blunt end is slightly larger also sharper end is slightly smaller and sharper okay so this is a curette and a curette is used to curette out or to basically so this is a uterine cavity i need to introduce the blunt end in a pregnant uterus and gently scrape all the uterine walls to make sure everything has come out so it's like a scraper you scrape the uterine walls okay and the sharp end is used in non pregnant uteruses say you are doing a endo you want an endometrial biopsy for an abnormal uterine bleeding or you have a patient who's come with uh persistent bleeding say 45 year old lady with persistent bleeding not responding to medical management you want to do a therapeutic or a hemostatic curettage so we do a curettage with this we get tissue and the bleeding also we get tissue for biopsy and the bleeding also stops so this is a uh, used for gynecological purposes the blunt end is used for obstetric purposes and how do we know the procedure is complete when we get a grating sensation so like when you use a grater to grate something you get the same grating feel on all the uterine walls okay that means your procedure is complete what are what are the other signs of completion of procedure um, one is the the products of conception like stop coming out okay second is bu bubbling which we get Yes, uh, so you start this. seeing air bubbles, air bubbles. product stops, uh, stop coming out, bleeding stops, mm -hmm. and the internal loss. So we had used the dilators to dilate the internal loss. So the dil the, the internal at loss will start. Yeah. Yes, it will start. You will feel the os the uterus contracting over your instrument. So you will feel the internal loss is now. It will you will now. This will be introduced with difficulty now because the uterus is now closing up. Everything has been expelled. The uterus will start contracting by itself. Okay. That's yes. how you know the procedure is complete. Of course, if you want to confirm that the procedure is complete, you will do an ultrasound to confirm that the uterine cavity is empty. Mm. Okay, so this is about a uterine curette. Okay, now uh, let's move on. Okay, suppose you don't have this also with you. Okay, we don't have an MVA. You don't have a suction um, uh, apparatus. 
and a patient comes bleeding incomplete abortion okay what will you do you say you're in a very low resource setting you don't have any of these or your mva is not functioning it's malfunctioning what do you do we'll use this instrument to remove the products of conception okay can you see this i'll show from this end and then yes. like this okay this is an ovum forceps yes why is it called an ovum forceps because the end is like an egg it's an egg shaped end that's why it's called an ovum forceps what other particular noticeable feature do you see in this ovum forceps no ratchet is present yes see here and there is no lock all other instruments which i've shown till now this has a lock okay this has a lock okay so most other instruments which i'll show you in the uh, further also have a lock this doesn't have a lock why um, because we want a free mobility in removing the uh, products of conception also less trauma when we yes, close so the lock trauma is very important so what happens uh, if inadvertently i catch a bit of tissue say this my palm is i catch up to like here and it has a lock and i lock it i will end up damaging the uterus okay or the uterine tissue so it doesn't have a lock so even if i inadvertently catch it it will let go okay so this is why it doesn't have a lock because after all it's a blind procedure i don't know what is inside i don't know what i'm catching is i'm trying to catch the products i may catch the tissue here and if i lock it imagine my whole skin will get crushed okay so that's what will happen to the uterine the endometrium and the underlying myometrium so that's why it doesn't have a lock so that we just catch whatever is there and take it out once we've removed the products then we again use a curette to cure it out so it is also used apart from uh, evacuation of products in an abortion it is also used to take out say an endometrial polyp so there may be endometrial polyp although the gold standard would be to use a hysteroscope which i'll show you but this can also be used to take out a small endometrial polyp okay or retained bits of placenta post delivery okay or uh, as i said incomplete abortion mr or during a mtp okay so this is about an ovum forceps any doubts till now no ma'am okay all right next uh, okay so next important instrument if, if we continue with vaginal surgeries is this instrument okay so this is a what is this uh by a uh, biopsy forceps yes this is a punch biopsy punch. forceps okay so can you see this i'll just see if i can have something with which i can see punch biopsy of uh, paper or something yes okay so basically punch biopsy forceps is used to take a biopsy from a, a growth on the cervix either colposcopically you find an abnormal area or there is a growth on the cervix and you want to take a biopsy from there so we use this instrument this is a punch biopsy forceps and one thing important which they ask in the exams is where will you take the biopsy from say say there is a growth a 2 cm growth will you take it from the periphery of the growth or the center of the growth from the periphery yes okay. because the center area you may okay. find just necrosis yes, tissue yes. and you mean the the pathologist may not be able to give you a proper diagnosis what we are worried about is we should not be missing malignancy so if you take tissue from the periphery you will get better tissue okay so if you, this basically has blades fine blades there okay and they, when you take the biopsy okay it creates sort of a punched out lesion okay can you see this i took a biopsy of this and So the blades have nicely cut through so that's how it's yes, like a punch you have this punching machine it works like that similarly and the tissue comes here you can see the paper has come here and this is then sent for histopathology okay so this is a punch biopsy forceps used to take biopsies from abnormal cervical lesions either on colposcopy or on visual inspection or if there's a frank growth on the cervix okay so this completes our set of instruments used in vaginal surgeries next we will move on to abdominal uh, instruments so i'll just get them here okay so questions that can be asked um, uh, kunj you are an mbbs student yes ma i just gave my final year exam okay you just get okay so that's that's very nice okay so things that can be asked for neat pg which are commonly asked are which instruments they'll give you a list of instruments and they'll say which are used in dnc which are not used in dnc and this came in the recent i think oh. inict last year 
they ask cesarean section instruments. So quickly, if I will, I'll just quickly, since we've done this, instruments used in a dilatation and curettage, if you have to choose, you'll use a sim speculum, you'll use a valsalum or a tenaculum if given the option, then you'll use a uterine sound. Okay, if it's a pregnant uterus, you won't use a uterine sound. So read the scenario given. Okay, because of the risk of perforation. Then you'll use Hagar's dilators and then you'll use um, uh, a suction apparatus, the Carmen scan curate. Okay, so this is what you will use for a dilatation and curatage. Okay. So now let's use in abdominal surgeries and we will talk mainly about two uh, abdominal surgeries that is his head in section. Just, just, just hold on one second. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Okay. So now we come to instruments used in abdominal surgery. So let's just let's, let's, let's cover the basic instruments and then go to specific surgeries. Okay. So okay. this is the first instrument we use. This is used in vaginal surgeries also to basically, this is a sponge holding forceps or a ring forceps. It is used to clean the or prepare the parts, clean right. the parts of the uh, operative area. So you take a gauze piece in this uh, soaked in betadine. Okay, or whatever antiseptic solution you're using and you clean the parts. Okay, okay, so this is a long instrument. Okay, it is also, it can also be used to hold things. Okay, like in, uh, in vaginal surgeries, I told you the cervix. Okay, it can also be used to hold retained placental bits. Okay, same in abdominal surgeries, you can use it as a substitute for an artery forceps, if you are holding the placenta during a cesarean section, you're removing the membranes, get adherent, you want to remove the membranes, you can use this. Okay, you can also use it to hold certain structures like the uterine angles or um, uh, where, you where you don't want too much trauma. Okay, so this can be used in those areas. Okay, but primarily it is used to clean the uh, operative area. Okay. Now, uh, a few uh, instruments that I won't discuss too much in detail because they clash with surgery also. This is an artery forceps. Okay, you have long artery forceps, you have short artery forceps, you have straight artery forceps and you have curved. This is a curved short artery forceps. Okay, these are again used to clamp, to hold uh, structures like the peritoneum. It can be used to hold vessels, to ligate vessels, okay, bleeding vessels. It can be used. So artery has multi-purpose. It's a multi-purpose. It's atraumatic. You can see it just has serrations. It doesn't have any uh, teeth. Okay, this is an Alice forceps. Can you see clearly? This is an Alice forceps. Okay, it has a small triangular, triangular end and it has serrations at the end. So it's slightly traumatic, okay? It has small, small teeth, which are not very visible here, but this is an Alice forceps. An Alice forceps is used to hold uh, tough, uh, tough structures, tough structures tough, like tough. the rectus sheath. Yes. When you're opening the abdomen for say a cesarean or a hysterectomy, you hold the rectus sheath with this. You hold the angles of the uterus. So I will limit myself to um, um, uh, uh, gynae surgeries and obstetric surgeries. Okay, so Khadija is asking that possible for you to repeat the names of instruments once again. I will, Khadija. Can you tell me which instruments? The ones for DNC? Just let me know and I'll repeat those. So this is an Alice forceps. Primarily, we use it to use a rec hold, the rectus sheath, the peritoneum, and the angles of the uterus in a cesarean section. Okay, so it has slightly traumatic serrations at the end, small triangular surface area like uh, sort of uh, end it has and again you have long alice forceps and short alice forceps it is also used to hold the vaginal vault okay post hysterectomy once the uterus is out to hold the vault the edges of the vault the, the post graduates who are listening this is the instrument used okay next um, instrument is this okay this looks like an alice but see the surface area at the end it is very very wide it is a big triangle at the end and it has a large surface area again it is not traumatic you can see it just has serrations what is this instrument it's a green armitage forceps this is a green armitage forceps very good where is it used 
uh, it is used to secure the angles of the uterine incision after the yes so the, the angles if they are bleeding in a cesarean section so when we give a, to a cesarean section we give a lower segment incision say imagine this my hand is the uterus i cut like this okay and these are the two angles the two ends okay and if they bleed uh, usually we hold with an alice forceps but if the bleeding is profuse okay the angles can bleed because the uterine arteries are at the ends okay so then we use this instrument which has a large surface area and is atraumatic to catch the bleeding angles it's a very very important instrument very important use in cesarean section and uh, you should know a green armitage forceps how it looks like okay so karija is saying she wants to meet instruments using a dnc so we'll just quickly repeat karija you can note them down this is a sim speculum okay then we use either a tenaculum or a valsalum okay to hold the cervix then a uterine sound if this is if you're doing a procedure in a non pregnant uterus then dilate with hagar's dilators okay then either introduce the carman's cannula okay or you introduce the ovum forceps and evacuate whatever the products are and then you cure it with a uterine cure it okay uh, uh kunj i'm yet uh, i'm yet to come to cesarean section instruments okay yes, so Just we'll do question. that when sponsor we finish yeah yeah no problem. okay next instrument easy instrument what is this so babcock's forceps this is a babcock forceps okay this is a little thicker than the usual ones but this is the one we found in our ot we use in our ot this is a babcock's forceps it is used to hold delicate structures which delicate structure will you find in obstetrics gynae fallopian tube fallopian tube so if we're doing a fallopian tube ligation or if we're doing a fallopian tube recanalization so any struct any procedure where we're, uh, we're dealing with the fallopian tubes or you're doing a salpingectomy for an ectopic pregnancy we use the babcock's forceps okay so a delicate structure other uh, places where you we use this if we're holding the lymph nodes we're doing say a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection in surgery if we're doing an appendectomy to hold the appendix okay so this is where or we're holding the ureters okay in surgery or we're holding the margins of the bladder so surgical uses are more in obs and gynae we basically use it to hold the fallopian tubes and lymph node dissection Okay, you can see it is atraumatic. The fallopian tube, if you hold it, will will basically come inside here. It has no teeth. Okay, and yes. it is an atraumatic instrument. So Babcock's forceps is for cesarean section. Okay. okay. Now a few more things which we use in abdominal surgery, which are common to surgical instruments, are these. Okay, this is a Metzenbaum scissors or a tissue cutting scissors. Okay, so if you want to, if you're doing a cesarean section, we give the nick. of the on the lower uterine segment and then we can extend the incision with the scissors or with our fingers okay in if we're doing a hysterectomy if we want to cut the ligaments we use a tissue cutting scissors if we're doing a salpingectomy we hold the tube with the babcock and then we cut the tube below like this okay so this is a tissue cutting forceps this is a needle holder okay a needle holder i think most of you know this you can see it has a short end Okay, this is how a needle yes. holder looks like. It's used for suturing, and this is a forceps. This is a toothed forceps. You have two types of forceps: a toothed and a non-toothed. I don't have a non-toothed here. This is a toothed forceps. So these are general instruments which are generally used for most surgical procedures. So I won't go into detail too much. There's nothing to talk about them. Also, they're very general instruments. Okay. Amongst the retractors, I have got only one because this is the one you need to know for ob obstetrics, especially for cesarean section. What is this retractor? It's a Doyen's abdominal wall retractor. Is, yes, so this is a Doyen's retractor. So a Doyen's retractor is used in cesarean section to access the lower uterine segment. Okay, so the uterus is here, and in front of the uterus lies the urinary bladder. The urinary bladder is basically what. Ha, tells us where the lower uterine segment is okay but a bladder a bladder the bladder has to be kept away from my field of surgery otherwise i will end up injuring the bladder so i use this retractor to keep the bladder down and away from my site of surgery so that i don't inadvertently end up injuring the bladder during a lower segment cesarean section that is the importance of this instrument this is a doyen's retractor it helps me keep the bladder away from my field of surgery primarily this is what you need to know 
Okay, so now let's just quickly summarize the instruments used in a cesarean section, okay, before we move further. So I start my cesarean by cleaning uh, the operative pain. area using a sponge holding forceps, right? Yes. Then I give an incision. I'm sorry, I don't have a scalpel, a BP handle and blade, but I think you all know how a Bart Parker uh, handle looks like. So with a scalpel or a scalpel, with a scalpel, I give my incision, okay? Once I skin, then comes the subcutaneous tissue, then comes the rectus sheath. So I incise the rectus sheath and I hold the rectus sheath with the, what is this? With the so Alice, Alice forceps. So, so sponge holder, BP handle, then uh, Alice blade. forceps holds the rectus sheath. And then I cut the rectus sheath. Again, I cut it transversely. Yes. Like this, the skin incision was also a fan and seal incision. Alice. Okay which is a smiling curvilinear incision, two, finger, two fingers above, above the, the pubic symphysis. Right. And then I give a nick in the subcutaneous, mm -hmm. in the rect rectus sheath, hold the rectus sheath with uh, the Alice forceps and yes. extend my incision. And then I separate the underlying rectus muscle, muscle. from the rectus sheath. Okay. And how then what do I do? I simply separate the separate two bellies thing. of the rectus abdominis. The rectus abdominis is like this. I just separate the bellies and I see what next structure I see is the parietal peritoneum. Okay, I yes. hold the parietal peritoneum with either an artery forceps or an Alice forceps and I cut and enter the peritoneal cavity. Once I enter the peritoneal cavity, I now see the uterus. Okay, and I need to see the lower uterine segment. So I introduce the doins and I can see the lower uterine segment. Now, the lower uterine segment is covered by the utero-vesicle fold of peritoneum, which is basically the visceral peritoneum. Okay, so yeah, so I need to open that. So I hold the visceral peritoneum again with an artery forceps. I take my scissors. Where is my scissors? So I take my scissors. I cut the visceral peritoneum. And now I can see the lower uterine segment. Okay. And then I, with the same uh, BP handle, I give a nick on the uterine incision, extend the nick. And now I've, I'm in the uterine cavity. So I take, deliver the baby. I deliver the baby. I deliver the, once the baby is out, I clamp the cord. We usually clamp the cord with artery forceps. Okay. Or any forceps you can use to clamp the. Uh, the umbilical cord, sorry, you clamp the umbilical cord with the forceps and then cut the cord, give the baby to the pediatrician. The placenta will come out next. Okay, so once the placenta is out, now I need to suture. What do I need to suture? The uterine incision. Yeah, so I have to hold the angles of the uterus with an Alice forceps. If she's bleeding a lot, I have to hold with a green armitage forceps. Okay, so both of them are used to hold the, can be used to hold the uterine angles. And then I suture using my needle holder and the forceps. Okay, I suture the lower uterine segment, then I suture the peritoneum, then I suture the rectus sheath, and then I suture the skin. Okay, so this is how we suture. Peritoneum may or may not be sutured. The rest are all sutured. Okay, so this is, these are the instruments used in a cesarean section. So I'll repeat, listen carefully. forceps to hold the rectus sheath. I use uh, Alice forceps and then I uh, use an artery forceps to enter the peritoneal to cut the peritoneum. I use a doins retractor to keep the bladder away. Okay, I incise the uterus, take the baby out, take the placenta out. Okay, then hold the uterine incision with a green armitage or with an Alice forceps. Okay, and then I start suturing. Okay, using a needle holder, using a forceps. Okay, so these are the instruments used in a cesarean section. Okay, I hope that's clear. Doing a tubal ligation with the cesarean, we will also use a Babcock's yeah. forcep. Okay, now I have some questions. Uh, Tanvi is asking, ma'am, maximum usage of suction evacuation till what weeks? Tanvi, so basically, um, uh, if we talk about first time for about MTP, we can use if we, we can do suction evacuation till 12 weeks. Okay. In the second trimester, also in many US countries, they are doing evacuation 
okay and they have special instruments even till 20 weeks they are doing okay but in our country we limit ourselves to 12 maximum 14 weeks we do suction evacuation okay beyond that we can do a um, we can uh, uh, do we can dilate the cervix and remove the baby for medical methods after 12 weeks 12 to 14 weeks is a gray area we can use both medical we can use both surgical but it doesn't respond very well to medical management so maximum 14 weeks i would say but till 12 weeks you can safely do suction evacuation okay now coming to some more instruments uh, okay what is this and this is a doyen's myoma screw okay this is a doyen's myoma screw so myoma screw is basically you can see it, the end is like a screw okay so what it is used basically in myomectomies just give me a minute my charger charging is low i'll just connect the charger to my laptop yes ma'am All right. So, um, uh, so this is a myoma screw. Okay. And we have the equivalent in laparoscopic instruments. Also, we have a laparoscopic myoma screw. Also, this is a myoma screw done in open myomectomies, fibroid uteruses. Okay. So if we're trying to remove the fibroid, what we do is we basically insert the screw into the fibroid. Okay. After we give the incision. So we give the incision. Okay. During a myomectomy over the serosa or the pseudo capsule of the fibroid we find, locate the plane of the fibroid, the correct plane, then introduce this and using traction of this, especially large fibroids, we get good traction of the fibroid and then we can dissect the remaining fibroid uh, uh, from the pseudo capsule and take it out. So this is called a myoma screw. It is a very useful instrument done used in myomectomies. Now for the postgraduates who are listening, um, uh, what questions they can ask are the principles of myomectomy. So what are the principles of myomectomy you should know because myomectomy is a very, is, is a, is a uh, you have a lot of, uh, what do you say, it's a uh, very bloody surgery. Uh, intraoperative bleeding. Okay, there are certain principles that you need to follow and you need to know those. Okay, so what are the principles? The principles are that as few incisions as possible. So if a patient has multiple fibroids, give as few incisions as possible on the uterus. Use tunneling incisions to remove the fibroids. Try to avoid too many incisions on the uterus because you'll have too many scars on the uterus, too many adhesions forming more chances of hematomas forming, okay? Give preferred vertical incisions on the anterior and the posterior wall and on the fundus prefer a transverse incision, okay? So those are some principles. Other than that, in ways to reduce blood loss. Preoperatively, what are the ways? Build up a hemoglobin, you can give a GnRH agonist. Intraop, what are the ways to reduce blood loss? You should know those. You can use Bonnie's myomectomy clamp. I don't yeah. have the instrument yeah. because we don't have it in the OT, but I think all of you know a Bonnie's myomectomy clamp. You can see the picture in the books. Or you can use a red rubber catheter or a red rubber tourniquet. Yes, Tanvi, you can use vasopressin also. And that will reduce the blood loss. Yes, vasopressin, red rubber catheter, Bonnie's myomectomy clamp. Okay. Oxytocin also, tranexamic acid, these are some other methods, okay, which can be used to reduce the blood loss, okay. Well, once the fibroid is out, obliterate all the dead space as much as possible with multiple layers if required of sutures. And on the surface of the serosa, the typical suture used is called a baseball suture, okay. So the baseball suture is such that minimal suture visible on the serosa so that there is less chances of adhesions forming okay so these are some of the principles of myomectomy there's a book called jeff coat jeff coat gives the principles of myomectomy very nicely books but it's very important to know okay 
so i think we are done with most of the abdominal and vaginal surgeries uh, questions for post graduates so they won't ask these simple simple questions which i am telling for post graduates they will directly go into surgeries okay so if they ask you uh, myoma screw they'll go into myomectomy if they give you a, a hysterectomy okay one thing i forget forgot these are hysterectomy clamps this instrument was left out okay these are yes this was just and we uh, kunj is asking types of sutures for the layers in lscs ma'am of okay, youtube question so in in cesarean section we suture the lower uterine segment if the incision is in the lower uterine segment we suture in one layer um for or against one or two layers it depends on what you've learned where you're practicing but one single layer and double layer both are justified in closing the lower uterine segment if it's a classical cesarean that means a section as is as is there in front and in the upper segment the cut is in the upper segment of the uterus that is a thicker segment and you need to close it in at least three layers okay we use the types of sutures we use non we use sorry uh, ab ab absorbable sutures we usually use vitrel which is a long term um, absorbable suture okay now this is a hysterectomy clamp okay there are different types of clamps this is a heenies clamp okay it is not traumatic it has no teeth you can also you also have cokers clamps which have which has a many there many different types of hysterectomy clamps they are usually heavy okay because they hold uh, they used to hold tough structures and vascular pedicles so they are heavy and they are usually atraumatic especially this is a atraumatic cokers is a traumatic clamp hysterectomy clamps if for post graduates in your viva from here they will go on to questions on uh steps of hysterectomy methods of hysterectomy indications of hysterectomy complications so you should know very very clearly steps of an abdominectomy steps of a vaginal hysterectomy okay so do you want me to tell them or uh, we can move on if any post graduates are listening steps of abdominal hysterectomy should we uh, do them now i'm in a brief if we can short brief. okay so brief. okay yes okay the, uh, so we'll uh, continue so basically uh, abdominal hysterectomy what we do is so nowadays we do laparoscopic hysterectomy also we will come to that also um basically in an abdominal hysterectomy since you're approaching from above from the, the peritoneal cavity so what we do is we first so the principle of a hysterectomy is to remove the ligaments called as clamp cut and ligate so we first clamp the ligament okay and then we cut it and then we put a ligature around it vascular ligaments now uh, this is important for mbbs students also okay so uh, the first ligament we clamp cut and ligate are usually the round ligament then we clamp cut and ligate the ovarian ligament and the the, the ovarian ligament behind now this is if we are preserving the ovaries so if we are keeping the ovaries we clamp cut and ligate the ovarian ligament but if we are removing the ovaries say the woman has the pathology in the ovary that's why we're doing a hysterectomy with a family history of ovarian cancer and you're doing a, a hysterectomy for fibroid you don't want to keep the ovaries leave the ovaries behind or say she is more than 60 years of age these are all indications for removing the ovaries so if you're removing the ovaries what ligament do we clamp cut and ligate if we are removing oh. the ovaries we clamp cut and ligate the infundibulo pelvic okay. ligament okay so the ovary is held in place this is the uterus say my hand is the uterus this is the ovary the ovary is attached to the uterus with the ovarian ligament and to the pelvic ligament so the ip ligament is here the ovarian ligament is here now if i am removing the uterus and i want to remove the ovary also i will clamp cut and ligate the infundibulo pelvic ligament But if I want to leave the ovary behind, I'm. She's a young patient, say forty year old. You're doing a hysterectomy for adenomyosis. No family history of ovarian cancer. You want to leave the ovary behind. So you, you to just remove the uterus. You will clamp, cut, and ligate the ovarian ligament, and then the ovary will be left behind in the body. Okay. But if you want to remove everything, you have to clamp, cut, and ligate the lateral attachment. That is the infundibulo pelvic ligament. Okay. So we uh, clamp, cut, and ligate the round ligament, the infundibulo pelvic ligament. then we open the leaves of the broad ligament okay on both sides this is done on both sides then we come down so down anteriorly what is there the urinary bladder yeah. so to 
to separate the bladder we have to again open the utero vesicle fold like we did in a cesarean section we open the uv fold push the bladder down okay and then what what important structure vascular structure lies on the lateral sides at the level of the cervix is the uterine arteries the uterine arteries so the uterine arteries very importantly we have to clamp cut and ligate okay now the to, to do that the very important to remember at the level of the uterine arteries also we can risk injury to the ureters okay what is the relationship of the ureter and the uterine artery uh so sir so water under the bridge so the yes very good artery is moving yes, above and the, the artery moves above very good so remember water under the bridge okay just hold on i'm getting an important call All right. So um, we clamp. Um, we uh, so, so what are they saying? The bridge over the water. water. So the ureters go below. The uterine artery crosses above. Okay. Ureters is basically water. Okay, and the bridge is going above. And this is very close to the level of the internal os. Okay, so when you're clamping the uterine arteries, you have to be very careful of this relationship. Okay, and how do we ensure that the uterine arteries are not injured? Is Okay, there are certain principles again when clamping the uterine artery. The first principle is that the lower most clamp, this is for postgraduates, the lower most clamp has to be applied first. Okay, it has to be applied perpendicular to the direction of the uterus and it has to be at the level of the internal os. Okay, so it has to be at the level of the internal os, it has to be perpendicular to the direction of the uterus and the lower most clamp has to be applied first. Okay, so that these are the important principles. Also important to remember is to skeletonize. That means remove all peritoneal tissue over the uterine arteries. Get a clear vision of the uterine artery. Do it under proper vision when you're ligating the uterine arteries. Ligate as close as possible to the uterus. Also, right, Peter is writing that. That is also correct. Ligate as close to the uterus as possible. Don't go lateral. The more you go lateral, the more chances of injury to the ureter. Okay, so after the uterine arteries, what comes next? So we ligate both the uterine arteries, then we go lower down, we have the cardinal ligament, that is the mackinac ligament, and posteriorly we have the uterosacral ligament. So we clamp, cut and ligate both these ligaments. We come further down where the cervix is, uh, where the vaginal vault is there, where the cervix is ending. We put two clamps there at the angles, that means where the cervix is ending, the external os where it is, and then we cut above that so the uterus comes out and then we suture the vaginal vault. So this is abdominal hysterectomy. This, the similar principles apply in a vaginal hysterectomy. The only thing is, is it's now we're starting from below. We're starting from below upwards. Okay. So what do we do? In a vaginal hysterectomy, we first have to enter the peritoneal cavity. So how do we do that? We have to first separate the bladder from anteriorly and posteriorly we have to en enter the pouch of Douglas. So once we've entered the anterior and posterior pouches, then we start ligating from below upwards. So the uterosacral ligaments, the cardinal ligaments, the uterine arteries, the broad ligament, and then the round ligament or wedding ligament. So it is now from below upwards rather than from up below. Okay. Uh, biology, that is a completely separate class altogether. Can you explain surgeries for prolapse? We'll do that in a separate session completely. Otherwise, we won't be able to finish instruments. Okay. Next, let's quickly move on to laparoscopic instruments because nowadays, um, for both undergraduates and postgraduates, laparoscopic instruments will be the norm. Uh, no one is going to ask you abdominal sur surgeries anymore. People are going to ask you vaginal surgery. I'm sorry, laparoscopic surgeries. Okay. So let's start with that. Okay. So laparoscopy surgeries, laparoscopy is indicated in, gyno in, in gynecology in, um, uh, for both diagnostic purposes and for therapeutic, that is, uh, uh, surgical purposes. So we can diagnose patients who have infertility, diagnosis of endometriosis, 
um, uh, we can uh, do so many surgeries. Almost every surgery, except maybe cancer surgeries, are uh, can be achieved now laparoscopically. So whether it's a hysterectomy or a ovarian hysterectomy or a salpingectomy for a ectopic pregnancy, almost anything can be done by laparoscopy also. Okay. Now the principle of laparoscopy is a Creating a pneumoperitoneum. Creating a pneumoperitoneum. So creating a pneumoperitoneum basically means gas in the abdomen. So if the abdomen is distended with gas, we are able to see much more clearly, visualize the structures under magnification. Okay. So it becomes very, very easy once the abdomen is distended with gas. Okay. And the gas we commonly use uses carbon dioxide. Just hold on again. I'm sorry. Okay, so now you can see behind me, this is the laparoscopic tower. Okay, I hope it's visual, it's, it's visible. Okay. Yes. So we have a monitor, okay, on top. Okay, we have, this is the camera system. Okay, so this is the light system. The top one is a camera system, this one. This is the light system, okay. Ma'am, your voice is on mute. Ma'am, can't hear you. Huh? I'm sorry. Okay, so you can see behind me the laparoscopic system. On top is the monitor. Okay. Yes. This is where we see the image. Okay. Then we have this part is the camera system. The top part is the camera system. This bottom part is the light source. Okay, so because to see inside, we need light. So that's the light source. And this is the insufflator through which we get carbon dioxide gas into the abdomen. Okay, so the monitor, the image, the camera system, the light source and the insufflator. Okay, These, this is on the laparoscopic tower. Okay. The instruments we use are this. This is called a Berry's needle. Okay. And I just forget, forgot to get the trocars. Just give me a minute. I'll call and ask for the. Yes. So we use this, this is a varies needle. Okay, the purpose of a varies needle is to create pneumoperitoneum. Okay, so what we do is we give an incision, usually an infraumbilical or a supraumbilical incision is given in the abdomen. Okay, and we hold this varies like a pen. Okay, so it's basically a tubular, it's, like, it's a needle. So it, it has a hollow uh, structure inside. Okay, and it has two ends. Okay a blunt end here and a sharp end outside okay so and it has a spring action inside okay it also has a valve here to allow the gas to enter okay so what we do is we hold it at, at an angle of 45 degree to the patient's abdomen this is to avoid inadvertent injury to the major vessels in the abdomen that is the iota and the bifurcation into the um, um, uh, bifurcation the iota so what we do is we Hold, we introduce the varies like this, okay? And we hear two clicks. Once once it enters the rectus sheath and then when it enters the peritoneum. So we hear two clicks. That means we know we are inside the peritoneal cavity, okay? Um, very important is the angle, 45 degrees. Very important is the mechanism, the two ends here. You can see there's a blunt end and when I push it in, the sharp end is there. So this is a sort of a safety mechanism. Okay, it's a safety mechanism. You can see the blunt end is here. When I push, however, the sharp end is there. And once it enters the cavity, the blunt end avoids inadvertent injury to the bowel or any other structure which may get injured, vascular structure. So it has a safety mechanism in place. Its entry is 45 degrees. Okay, you hear 
two clicks and once you're inside the peritoneal cavity okay what you connect the tubing this from the insufflator there will be a tubing which you attach here okay and once this machine is on it will show you the intra abdominal pressure the intra abdominal pressure if you are correctly inside the peritoneal cavity will be less than 10 millimeters of mercury that's another sign that you're inside the peritoneal cavity remember before you attach or start the you should not be outside you should not be in the bowel you should bladder you should not be in a vessel okay because that will lead to disaster so how do you know what are the other ways you know you're in the cavity you put a bit of a, a drop of saline here okay and it gets sucked inside because the pressure in the cavity is very less anything you put at the top will get sucked inside immediately that is another sign that yes you're in the abdominal cavity you can also push 5 ml of saline and then try to withdraw it if it's in if your needle is in the cavity you will not be able to withdraw the same saline okay so these are these are other signs that yes you are in the cavity what are the signs that the pressure will be negative or less than 10 millimeters saline will get sucked in and once you push saline and you try to withdraw you will not be able to withdraw the saline that you have put so once you're sure you're in the cavity you attach the tubing switch on the gas and let the pressure build up okay so once the intra-abdominal pressure is around 20 millimeters of mercury is then we put what is called our ports okay a primary port through which the laparoscope will go so what is a laparoscope a laparoscope is this instrument okay this is a laparoscope okay this is basically a, a scope means it means you can visualize so it has a lens there you can see the lens and to this side we attach the camera okay so this is the camera this is the camera okay this is the camera we attach it to the laparoscope okay one second so this is how we attach it. Okay, you have different adjustments here. And the wire, this wire will go and connect to the camera system there. Okay, so this is a laparoscope. This is the camera. This is a camera which is attached here. Okay, and this is how we visualize. What comes here? Yeah. Here comes the light source. Okay, the light will come here. The camera will come here. And we'll be able to visualize the image on the screen okay so this how do we introduce this this will go through a primary port now what is a port we've created pneumoperitoneum with this we introduce this okay this is called a trocar and a cannula it's basically a hollow instrument okay i'll open it and show it to you see this okay this is actually just the he's not given me the cannula okay so you can see this is a very sharp instrument okay it comes with a sheath she's not given me the sheath this is this is just the trocar it comes with a cannula okay so once the berries creates the pneumoperitoneum we then introduce this in the cavity remove the trocar and the sheath remains through the sheath the laparoscope okay so this is a sheath yes. And the laparoscope goes inside the sheath. So these are this is like my this is my primary port. Similarly, we will create secondary ports, two or three or four, depending on whatever surgery we are doing. And through those ports, we'll laparoscopic instruments like like this. Okay, so this is a laparoscopic instrument. Okay, you can see it's much thinner than the scope. So the scope yeah. is usually introduced through a 10 millimeter port. The diameter is around one centimeter. And the laparoscopic instruments are introduced through five millimeter ports. Okay, so these are called secondary ports. Again, a sheet will be there through, the, through which this instrument will go. And they're different instruments. This is a grasper. You can have scissors. You can have graspers. You can have suction cannulas can have electro pottery instruments so different different instruments go in through the secondary ports 
through the primary port will be our camera system with the scope with the light source. Okay, is this clear till now so far? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I will repeat. Um, we have an image system, we have a camera system, we have a light source, and we have insufflators. Okay, we have a uh, varies needle through which we create pneumoperitoneum, and we usually create pneumoperitoneum through the um uh very needle and usually created infraumbricular or supraumbricular incision if the patient has previous multiple surgeries you may anticipate adhesions so what we can also tumor peritoneum through another point which is the point in the left upper abdomen okay that Sorry, point is the, usually the voice broke in between which point that okay so palmer it's called as palmer's point can you hear me now yes now better palmer's point is an area which is usually safe, usually adhesion free. The patient has previous surgeries. It is a point in the left upper abdomen. Okay, so that point can also be used to introduce the varies needle and create pneumoperitoneum. So once we've created pneumoperitoneum, so this is the cannula. I'll just show you. Okay, so this is a secondary port. So I said we can either use a primary port. Okay, um, this is the trocar to create the primary port. You can see it's a 10 millimeter port through which we introduce the laparoscope. We can also use for the secondary ports, we use five millimeter ports. So this is a trocar and this is the sheath I was talking to you about. This is a cannula. So we introduce this, okay, and then we remove the trocar, okay, and through this, we introduce our different laparoscopic instruments will enter through this okay so this is these are our yeah. secondary ports okay so and we can attach the gas tubing here so that the gas con continuously enters the abdomen yeah. okay so this is how we do laparoscopic surgery so the principle of laparoscopic surgeries are you should know what this tower is you have an image monitor a camera system a light source and a gas insufflator okay to create the pneumoperitoneum we use a varies needle and then we, once the gas is in the abdomen, then we use primary ports, okay, or and secondary ports, okay, to create our operating site. To the primary port, we introduce this instrument. This is the laparoscope. We attach the camera, the light source, and this will show us this. This is this will show us our field of surgery, and then we operate using the instruments which are put in the secondary port. So we can have one secondary port, usually if it's a diagnostic procedure, if we're doing a hysterectomy, we may need up to three or even four ports to do a hysterectomy. Okay, so I hope this is clear laparoscopic surgery. Now in laparoscopic surgery, we uh, if we're doing say a laparoscopic hysterectomy, this is for the postgraduates, we do, we use, uh, we, we have to use uh, uh, basically um, uh, energy sources. Energy sources are, are basically uh, uh, ways to coagulate or to seal vessels. Okay. Now, energy sources which we use could be monopolar, bipolar, and nowadays we have what is called harmonic, okay, which is ultrasonic energy source. And we also have other instruments like ligature and N seal. Okay. So these are five energy sources which you should know monopolar bipolar harmonic okay we have n seal and ligature so they're basically ways to coagulate because here we don't clamp cut and ligate like in an abdominal hysterectomy here we coagulate and we cut okay we don't use sutures okay as we can use sutures also but they become very cumbersome during laparoscopic surgery so the procedure here is to coagulate using a energy source like a like a bipolar and then we cut okay so remember this the postgraduates okay now the other endoscopy which is important for us is this what is this instrument this is a hysteroscope okay so this is a hysteroscope it again comes with a sheath 
and uh, I'll just dismantle this and show you. So this is the hysteroscope. Okay. It, it is similar to how a laparoscope looks like. Yes. Okay. So this is a laparoscope and this is a hysteroscope. The only difference is it is much, much thinner. Okay. We have hysteroscopes as thin as two millimeters. Okay. Or as thick as five millimeter, but usually not beyond five millimeter because we just have to introduce this in the cervix, right? To visualize yeah. the uterine cavity. So hysteroscope is to visualize the uterine cavity. Again, we have diagnostic hysteroscopy. Say a patient comes with abnormal uterine bleeding and you want to take a directed biopsy. So we do a hysteroscopic guided biopsy, which is the gold standard for taking an endometrial biopsy. Or say she has a submucous fibroid, that is a fibroid in the endometrial cavity and you want to remove it. So we do a hysteroscopic myomectomy or she has an endometrial polyp. We do a hysteroscopic polypectomy or she is, she's infertile with a septa we do a hysteroscopic septal resection. So this is the hysteroscope. We visualize the inside of the... This was a laparoscope. Okay, so the thing is the same. Again, the hysteroscope, the only thing is with the hysteroscope, we have the sheath. Okay, so we have an inner sheath and we have an outer sheath. Okay, this is an operative hysteroscope. Why is it an operative hysteroscope? Because it has this channel. This is a... This is an operating channel. Okay, so the gold standard for endometrial biopsy is a hysteroscopic guided biopsy. Okay, so this is the channel for uh, uh, introducing instruments. Instruments. Okay, so this is how the hysteroscope is attached. Okay, so now this is this is like my one. I, I like in laparoscope, you have different ports for different surgeries. Here we have a single thing. The uterus has only one opening, so everything has to go through here, through the cervix. So the thing, this whole channel goes through here. Okay. Now, this is basically through which my fluid will enter and exit. Okay. So here we don't use gaseous distension media. We use a liquid distension media. Okay. And we usually use normal cell saline or we use glycine or mannitol. Okay. These are the distending media we usually use. Normal saline, glycine or mannitol are the commonly used distending media because the uterus is collapsed. You have to open it up to visualize the uterus. Like the abdominal cavity we use liquids to distend the uterine cavity. So we introduce this, okay? And then through these channels, we at attach tubing, okay? And this will, this fluid will go inside and it will open up the uterine cavity. And again, we attach the camera system here. Okay? Yes. One second. Again, we attach the camera system here. Okay? And this is our hysteroscope. The light source will come here. And again, we'll be able to see on the image. Suppose as a polyp, I introduce a instrument here, a very small instrument, a very thin instrument is introduced here, which will come out from here, say a scissors, where I can do a polypectomy. Or say she has a missing intrauterine device. We, it's a missing thread, the thread has cut off. So we introduce a grasper from here and we grasp the intrauterine device and we pull it out. So I have a lot of hysteroscopic videos on my Insta channel you can go and have a look like how to take out a missing intrauterine device, how to do a polypectomy. A lot of diagnostic hysteroscopies are there. So you will have a better idea if you actually see those videos. Okay, so check them out on my Insta and you will find some of them are on YouTube also. The name of my channel is uh, OBG Classes by Dr. Rena. On Insta, it is with underscore, I think. Let me just check and tell you exactly. So it is... Yes, it is OBG classes by it is OBG classes by Dr. Rena. Can you see that? Okay, it's coming yes. older, but you will find it on Instagram. Okay, the link is on my YouTube channel also. Okay, so this is um, uh, the history. It's used to visualize the uterine cavity and we can also do operative hysteroscopy using this instrument. We can remove endometrial polyps. We can remove adhesions like in Ashman syndrome and we can cut uterine septic. Okay. Uh, so I think this completes. Uh, Kunj, anything missed out? Um, 
No, ma'am, almost covered. Okay, oh, very important have, for, for the for the okay one instrument I completely left out for the uh, postgraduates, also the undergraduate, but more importantly postgraduates. What is this? Can anyone tell me what is this instrument? This huge instrument. Tanvi, Tanvi, West Tanvi. I know she's a postgraduate student. Uh, okay, so this is a uterine manipulator. Okay, so remember when we are doing laparoscopy hysterectomy, when we're doing a laparoscopic hysterectomy, we use this instrument, we introduce it from the vagina. Okay, this part goes inside the uterus and using this, we manipulate the uterus. We can move the uterus in whatever direction we want. Okay, we can move it to the left, the right, up and down. And this improves the visualization during laparoscopy. Okay, this part here prevents gas from leaking. And this part here, this white part here, helps us define the vaginal vault. That is the lower limit of the external os. It helps us define the lower limit of the cervix so we can cut the vaginal vault at this point. Okay, so this is a uterine manipulator. Very important instrument in um, uh, laparoscopic surgeries, especially laparoscopic hysterectomies. It comes and this may be common, this may be asked as an image in your exams, uh, undergraduates also, okay, because it is now being very, very commonly used. Laparoscopic hysterectomy is now becoming the norm for hysterectomy. All right. So, any doubts? And one doubt which I got just now, like for hysteroscopy, why can't we use gaseous medium and Okay, so gaseous medium, very good question. So gaseous medium can also be used. We can use carbon dioxide. In fact, gaseous media gives very good visualization. But the problem is, what happens is gaseous distension cannot be used if the patient is bleeding or if we're doing an operative procedure. We cut the polyps there and the polyp starts bleeding. So okay. that will completely blur our vision. But in liquid, what happens? In liquid, there are two tracks, an inflow and outflow. Okay flow channel okay so liquid is better if you're trying to do an operative hysteroscopy but yes you can use gas also in hysteroscopy and co2 can be used but we commonly use liquid for the purpose that if there is blood we won't be able to see with gas yes ma'am we actually love this class very much like an entirely wonderful I'm session for this we learned I'm, actually live instruments like which you opened in front of us. It was a very wonderful session for us. We are indeed very grateful to you for this. Thank class. you so much for having me over. Uh, and um, I hope I've, I think I've missed out a few things. I feel I've missed out some things. But if anyone has any doubt, you can uh, person drop me a message on in the comment section or uh, yeah, and I will definitely get back to you. All right. Yes, ma'am. So. Thank you thank very you. much, ma'am, once thank again. Thank you, so, thank you, so everyone. So almost like one of the best classes still did on the white army session. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you, you ma'am. Okay. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, everybody, Bye. for active interaction. And thank you, one and all. Have, have a nice day. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. Bye, ma'am.